Hi everyone, welcome back to 5 Minute Medicine. In today's video, I'll give you a brief overview of pelvic inflammatory disease. So pelvic inflammatory disease is caused uh, or is an infection of the upper genital tract, which can affect the uterus, the fallopian tubes and ovaries, as you can see on this diagram here. Some of the main causes are chlamydia, which is the commonest cause, which is a gram-negative bacterium, as you can see here. And the second commonest cause is gonorrhea, which is a gram-negative diplococcus, which you can see here. Some of the main risk factors to be aware of for pelvic inflammatory disease is unprotected sex, being between the ages of 15 and 24, and history of STIs. Next, I would like to give you a brief overview of the clinical features. So the patients uh, complain of those three main groups, which is abdominal pain, menstrual abnormalities, and systemic features. The abdominal pain is in the lower quadrants, and it can radiate to the back. Some of the menstrual abnormalities patients will complain of are menorrhagia, abno ab abnormal vaginal discharge, and intermenstrual bleeding. And then lastly, some of the systemic features to be aware of are fevers, particularly those over 30 degrees Celsius, as well as some other typical features of an infection, such as chills and night sweats. However, in some ca cases, patients will also complain of dysuria. But how do you investigate pelvic inflammatory disease? Well, there's multiple tests that can be run, one of them being an endocervical swab, where a nucleotide amplification test is done uh, in order to test for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Additionally, you can do a full blood count, which will show you um, elevated white cells, which could be suggestive of the infection. And then additionally, for pelvic inflammatory disease, you can do something called a wet mount, where you take some of the vaginal secretions and look at them under the microscope and if you see polymorph nuclear cells, um, that would be very suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease. Lastly, you can also perform a urine test in order to exclude other possible causes of pain and discomfort, such as pregnancy or a simple UTI. Um, in someone with pelvic inflammatory disease, those should be negative. In terms of management, um, it is split between mild, moderate and severe disease. Again, this is based off of the 2022 UK guidelines, so it can vary depending on where you live. But um, the first line management for mild or moderate disease is parenteral cephalosporin, uh, as well as oral doxycycline and oral metronidazole for 14 days. So a single IM injection of a cephalosporin and those two oral antibiotics. However, if someone cannot tolerate cephalosporins, you can use fluoroquinolone or azithromycin and metronidazole for 14 days. Severe disease requires hospitalization and the use of IV ceftriaxone, doxycycline and metronidazole. However, if a patient shows clinical improvement after 24 or 48 hours of IV antibiotics, they can be switched back to oral route. Um, some of the criteria for severe disease are a tubal ovarian abscess, someone who cannot tolerate oral fluids, or someone who is unable to follow an oral regimen for one reason or another, such as disability, neurological issues, etc. Lastly, some of the complications I would like to discuss. One of them is called Fix Hugh Curtis syndrome, which is an inflammation of the hepatic capsule and of the diaphragm which causes adhesions which can result in pleuritic pain in the patient. Next there is risk of abscesses uh, such as the tubo ovarian abscess and patients who suffer from pelvic inflammatory disease um, have the risk of ectopic pregnancies tripled compared to those who never suffered from it. That was a very brief overview of this condition. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave, leave them down in the comments and I'll be happy to answer. But other than that, thank you so much for listening.